Hello, I'm Michael Redmond, Professor on GoPlay. In this video, I'm continuing with my beginners series of videos, and I'm moving on to the 13 by 13 board. As the board gets bigger, it becomes more important to focus on the entire board position and a bit more difficult, but that's also going to introduce some of the more beautiful aspects of the game, I think, in that players are um, making strategies that are based on relatively large areas. So I'm going to start talking about that with this 13 by 13 game that I'm going to show you today. I'm also going to be focusing on the first moves that you play towards a corner. To start with, I did mention in an earlier 9x9 game that I talked about how it's considered polite to play in the upper right part of the board for your first move. That's just Black's first move that I'm talking about. It has been decided that it's polite to play in the right part of the upper right corner. So that's somewhere inside this triangle. And strategically, it doesn't really make any difference whether you play this move in the upper right corner or the upper left corner. It's the same 4-4 four -four move. It's the same stone that you're playing, four lines from, from each side of the corner. It's four lines from here, and it's fourth, the fourth line from this direction also. So if you're going to play the 4-4 four -four point, it doesn't really matter whether you play in the upper right or the, any other of the corners, but it's considered polite to play in the upper right. So I think it's good to be polite. And after that, when white chooses to play towards a corner, it's okay for white to choose whichever corner white wants to play. And that's because there is a strategic um, value, a difference in this move and, for instance, this move. It would have a different relationship with that black stone that's already on the board. So in this case, white is free to choose the corner. Now, you might note that I'm playing these moves a few lines away from the edge of the board. Uh, this is also something that I mentioned in a previous video, but it's it's really bad to put stones on the edge of the board because that stone at L1 is not influencing any areas. And it's more like an example of when I was talking about how you capture stones by chasing them towards the edge of the board. Stones tend to be very weak and vulnerable when they're at the edge of the board. So it's a bad idea to play on the edge of the board, almost as bad to play on the second line. So when you see strong players play, the first four moves are usually towards the corners, and most of the opening moves are on the third or fourth line. Sometimes you're sort of forced to play and move on the second line. If you have a, a specific meaning to it, if there's some reason that you want to play on the second line, sometimes it's okay. Black continues with this move, and white continues with this move. This, these two moves are the three four points, and they are also a very common, popular uh, first move towards a corner. In the 9x9 nine nine game, and I will um, leave links to the related uh, videos in the description. Also, probably I'll manage to put a link up there somewhere. I did talk about a move at the 3-3 three, three point. This is also a valid first move. It's a good move towards the corner, and it has a very strong control over the area below it, towards the edge of the board. So I would doubt that black would want to invade inside in, inside the blue line that I've just written. Whereas the star point, we will find that the star point has a more loose control over the corner, and there is some potential for white to invade at the what we call the 3-3 three, three point. So it's not so much as controlling the corner, but it does have quicker development towards the sides and the center. So it's a trade-off. These two moves the mark moves, they are creating a stronger control over the corner than you could accomplish with just one stone. So these two black stones control the lower right corner more strongly, and by creating a strong connected shape, you might recall that these two marked stones, they are um, in a shape that I call the one space jump. This is a connected shape, and having two stones coordinating with each other so strongly creates a strong position that is, I would say, it influences these two directions. The two sides, the two adjacent sides, are influenced by the strong position that black has. For instance, if white were to jump in here, this white stone would immediately come under attack. With a lot of black stones participating in that attack, it would be dangerous for white. So white also plays a corner closer. 
And corner enclosure is what we call these shapes where a player has played two stones to surround the corner. When both players have played a corner enclosure like this, the game starts with the players mapping out spheres of influence, you might say, where they control areas of the board. Because white is not only controlling this lower left corner, white is also getting some control of the left side. And I can also say that black has controlled the lower right corner, but also has a, a degree of control over the right side. So they're, the players are creating areas in which if a fight occurs, that player will have a, an advantage. Now black invades the upper left corner. This invasion at the 3-3 point has become a very popular move in recent years. So it's something that you will be seeing and you would like to be able to handle it. When black invades the 3-3 point here, black's idea is to make a living shape in the corner. And white gets to choose which direction black goes. When black invades the 3-3 point in a corner where white already has the one stone here, white wants to attack it to a certain degree. And white has a choice of covering on the left or towards the upper side. So white could choose to play here, which would actually coordinate well with the two marked white stones. Or white could choose to cover here. And this would block off the upper side. So if white plays this way, black would crawl. Let's just give this one example, which is a very common joseki. And when I say joseki, that's a sequence of moves that you play in the corner. And it's considered to be good or playable, for uh, viable for either player. In a game played by strong players, both sides would be satisfied to play this sequence. So in this case, white has made a wall of stones here and will have control over the right side. So white will be able to, for instance, play a move somewhere around here. And I would suspect that this area is going to be a territory for white. In the game, actually, white covered on this side. And White's idea here is that White already has those two marked stones in the lower left corner. And since those stones are there already, and in Go you're not allowed to move your stones around the board, so having those two stones, White's idea is to coordinate with them in White's following moves because it's going to be relatively easy to establish an area here, or maybe probably a territory. So that's White's idea. White, White's getting a territory on the left side of the board using the stones that White has played already. And in Go, it's very important to consider the meaning of the stones that you've played already, because as you're not allowed to move them around the board, they're just going to stay there. The value of those stones is going to change depending on how you coordinate with them in your following moves. So Black rolls here, White extends, why is creating a connected shape, a wall that is influencing in this direction, helping white to surround this area. And this is an example of a move on the second line. The two marked stones create a nice jump, we call it. And this is a connected shape because if white pushes through, uh, black will cover here and white cannot cut the diagonal without that white stone would just be captured, chased to the edge of the board. So that's a connected shape. Black has established an area here which is going to be a black territory eventually. So white extends here. You can see that white is keeping to the third line. So three lines from the edge of the board. By playing this move, white has controlled this area, and that's connected up to this area and this area. So white has created a sphere of influence in the lower left part of the board. Having taken the sides, uh, having taken control of the side, White is thinking of playing some more moves towards the center at a later part of the game. And if White managed to play these three points, now the whole area would become White territory. So finally, White would be getting to surround the center after playing these three moves. Black's move was played here. Now this move is a diagonal connection. It's a connected shape with the two marked stones. 
And black has started with these three stones that were not really connected to the right half of the board yet. And adding a stone to them, black is drawing a line here to connect up to the upper right corner and controlling this area on the upper side. So that's one thing that black has accomplished with this move. Also, I was talking about how white would like to surround the center, for instance, with moves like this. But obviously, white is not allowed to play three moves in a row. So by playing the diagonal connection here, black has actually prepared to play this move towards the center, which would be a one space jump, a connected shape again. So black is preparing to reduce white's area in the lower left corner at the same time as enlarging black's area on the right side. So now white decided to invade black's area in the upper right. Up to this point, both players were surrounding areas and creating spheres of influence. But white decided that this time black has so much area here White doesn't want to leave it like that. Often you will see players playing an attachment when they want to invade an area that is occupied by a lot of the opponent's stones. The reason is that this is a direct attack against the marked black stone, and black is going to answer it locally. It means white's going to get a number of sort of forcing moves, which black will probably answer. And maybe white can get the momentum to save this white stone, because white is in a kind of a cramped position here. So black answered here. This is blocking off the corner area. Black is trying to establish a territory in the upper right corner. White, white stone is in danger here, so it's important for white to pull back on the third line. And now these two black stones, the marked black stones, they're a diagonal shape, and there is going to be an issue there if white cuts. So since there is a white stone attacking the diagonal at this point, it's a good idea for black to connect or come down here. This also creates a connected shape. So white played the attachment here. Again, white is trying to create an exchange of moves in this area so that white can quickly create some kind of a shape on the right side of the board. Black um, answers it here. And locally, White's idea is to play a move on the second line here, which would start sliding into this lower right corner, which Black thought was Black's territory. So White is trying to get into the corner here. And Black plays um, down to stop that. This is a very natural move. White is still weak on the right side. White doesn't really have quite enough space. So White curls around. And this is uh, threatening to play an Atari here, which would be a nice shape. So black extends, and black has established this territory. White continues to escape. So white is building an area here, which white is hoping will be big enough to make two eyes. And you have to have some space to make the two eyes shape. Usually it's good to have something like six to eight points Something that looks like a six to eight point territory is usually going to be enough for it to be uh, two eyes. So white is trying to create some territory, also is maybe hoping to connect up to the white stones on the left half of the board. Black plays here. Now this is an important move because we might have noticed that black's territory here, black has only surrounded it from this side. Black has a wall here, but this, this side of it is still wide open. So by playing this move on the second line, black is establishing a wall, the second wall for black's territory. And when black is close up the lower side here, as well as the right side, I feel safe in saying that this is going to be a black territory. So black made the final wall to, to protect the territory there in the corner. Also black is threatening to play another move in that direction and crawl into white's territory, which uh, white was making a territory like this. So if black were to play here, that would reduce that. So white covered, white's keeping this area. After playing that exchange, black continued towards the center of the board. And black is attacking this white group on the right. 
White handled that by pushing a few times here. And White has a space here that is probably going to be good enough to make two eyes. But also White has the option to connect up to that group. So after playing this exchange, White actually feels fairly safe about these stones that White has on the right side of the board and can start to think about White's potential territory on the left half of the board. Because White made the wall here and was hoping to make a territory, an area like this. And it's not quite established yet, especially when we have this black stone pointing out in the center of the board. It looks like black is starting to, to get in there. So this was the timing that White chose to play a protective move here. White's idea is to establish a boundary like this, and already White has a fairly strong control over this area. So this is the area that White is considering to be White's territory. So that's the um, opening stages of the game. I will take you throughout to the end game. Black uh, covered here, and this was strengthening the wall for Black's territory here. And let's just take a look at the end game moves. White played here. White is trying to get into Black's territory. This move on the first line here, diagonal on the first line, is a move that you will be seeing again. So um, it's important to recognize these patterns that happen quite a good deal in the end game. And Black is now, this, these two stones are diagonal and in danger of being cut by White move here. So this sequence of four moves is a fairly common sequence that's played towards the end of the game. And having established this line, White uh, starts to look at moves on the second and first lines here. So uh, this, th these moves were an example of how, as the game develops, in the later stages of the game, you do start playing moves closer to the edge of the board as you're making the final borders for your territories. So White played this move, and this is establishing the wall for White's territory on the left side of the board and reducing Black's upper, upper left corner. And here the players are just trying to establish territory lines. When Black plays this move, White does have to start to feel a bit uneasy about these stones because the space where White was hoping to make two eyes seems to have been reduced a bit by this final Black move that was played. So this is a good time for White to finish connecting up to the left. So White has made a connected shape here, connected to this big territory that White had on the left. That makes these stones on the right safe. And at this point, the players are just establishing the borders of their territories. So I'll take you quickly through the end game. Not to go into too much detail here. And at this point, a strong player would say that the game is over. Now, if you're a beginner, then you will see a lot of diagonal shapes in which you want to figure out um, why that's okay. So like if um, the white player felt that maybe there's something inside this area that black is thinking of as his own territory, it's perfectly okay, for instance, for white to try um, attacking uh, a position that is not completely connected like this. Hopefully black would notice that these two stones are in a tardy about to be captured, because if Black plays some other move, White's going to capture the two stones. Hopefully Black would notice that and connect it. And the White stone would be in a target. Black would be able to chase it to the edge of the board and capture it. So that's just an example of how these things happen. White could attack here. Black would have to notice that this one stone is under attack, and that Black can save it by capturing the White stone first. So there's various things that White could try. Um, the verdict is that none of them will work. The same goes for, for instance, uh, say White plays, decides the game is over and plays one of these points. It would be perfectly okay for Black to try this, um, but it would not work. These Black stones would be chased to the edge of the board and captured. So to go back to the finished position here, um, with a computer or playing on the net, it would be very easy because the program would calculate it for you. So you wouldn't have to do anything. You just allow the computer to calculate it and agree with the final score. So that would uh, do it for you.
In an actual board position, when you're playing against opponent face-to-face, -face, the players have to count the score. And counting one, two, three throughout something like 40 points, um, it's a bit of a hassle. So there's a way we do it. So I do want to show you an example of how we count the game. What you do is once you've agreed that the game is over, that implies that you agree that this area is Black's territory, the area surrounded by these stones, and this area is Black's territory, and this area is White's territory. So the areas that the plays, players have staked out, if you agree that the game is over, you're agreeing that these areas are actually territories. Once you've agreed that, it becomes possible to rearrange the stones to make rectangular shapes that you can calculate easy. So for instance, moving the black stones like this would create a five by four shape, which is clearly 20 points. It makes it easy to count that black territory. The fact that the players have agreed that that's a black territory after all, it makes it um, okay. Um, you don't have to be worried about these holes in the wall because um, in actual practice, you've agreed that that's a black territory. So it's not going to be an issue. Same thing could happen here. These stones could be rearranged. You could put a black stone in the middle there because three by seven is 21 points. So that's 20 now. You put a black stone in there. Black has 46 points. When you rearrange the stones like this, it's just a little bit of multiplication and you can get the answer. So let's do that for white too. This is three by 10. And let's make this territory on the right two by five. So that's 30 points, 40 points for white. Black has 46 points. In Go, it's customary to have a komi, which is a handicap that black gives white in return for black having the first move of the game. So people say that having played the first move on the board, black has six or seven points advance. And because in professional play, we don't like to have draws. We make the Komi six and a half points. So if black wins by six points, then white has won by half a point because black has to give white a handicap called Komi that is six and a half points. Or if black had won by seven points, we would say that black has won by half a point because black gave a six and a half point Komi. So in this case, black is winning by six points, but when you subtract the Komi from black's score, White wins by half a point. So that was the result for this game. And an, an example of counting the game, which is something that it's good to learn how to do this, unless you want to count it one point at a time up to 40. And that's it for this video. So I hope you enjoyed. If you liked the video, like it, and subscribe for more videos like this. Thank you for watching.